So welcome to those folks who, who have joined us on Zoom this morning and those who are joining us on Facebook and YouTube. And so we give thanks for this gathered community that gathers from a distance to be God's people in this time and in this, this dispersed space. So welcome. And so we begin our worship time and settle in this morning as Carrie plays for us. She's playing the heart of worship. So just a technical thing. Debbie, can you highlight the sanctuary? Tim is saying he can only see you. Ah, there we go. That's better, thank you. So as we continue in our worship time together today, we remember that in this area of Saskatchewan, we worship and live and serve on Treaty 4 territory, which is the traditional home of the Cree, Anishinaabe, and Métis peoples. And so if you were watching this from elsewhere in Canada, take a few moments to give thanks for the Indigenous peoples in your area. We give thanks for the stewardship of this land, and we seek ways of sharing the land with respect for all creation. We are all Treaty people, and we live into the hope of healing relationships. Light this candle, 
reminding us of holy ground. Reminding us that even in the wilderness places, God is present. God comes to us. God speaks to us. And so we open ourselves to God's presence speaking to us and within us this morning. And so Roseanne is going to read our call to worship for us this morning. This is based on Psalm 1. Give God, give thanks to God. Tell everyone what God does. Sing to God. Let your heart smile. Ask for God's help. Praise God. Thank you, Roseanne. And so as we enter into a few moments of silence, I invite you to think about the imagery that Roseanne read for us this morning and imagine your heart smiling. What does it feel like when your heart smiles? And so just take a few moments and allow your heart to smile and feel that, that smile growing within you. And so we have an opportunity to sing. I'm going to sing God of the Bible, which is in more voices. It's number 28, if you're going to look it up in a hymn book. And for those of you who get our uh, newsletter on paper during the week, you should have the words should have arrived for you to follow along throughout the service today. So God of the Bible.
do not change. Fresh as the morning, sure as the sunrise, God always faithful, you do not change. Hope we must carry, shining and certain, through And Mylene has our scripture reading for us this morning. Mylene, your mic isn't on. Of the wilderness and came to God's mountain to Horeb. The angel of God appeared to him in a flame of the fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Moses said, I will turn aside now and see this great sight while the bush is not burned. When God saw that he turned aside to see, God called to Moses out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, here I am, Moses replied. God said, don't come close. Take off your sandals from off your feet, for the place you are standing on is holy ground. I am the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham and Sarah, the God of Isaiah and Rebecca, and the God of Jacob and Leah and Rachel. Moses hid his face for the for he was afraid to look at God. God said, I have seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out, out of that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Huvite, and the Jebusite. Now, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me. I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them, Come now, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring for the children of Israel out of Egypt? God said, I will be with you. This will be the sign I give you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Moses said to God, when I come to the children of Israel and tell them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you. And they asked me, what is God's name? What should I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. You shall tell the children of Israel this, I am, I am has sent me to you. 
Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham and Sarah, the God of Isaiah and Rebecca, and the God of Jacob and Leah and Rochelle has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our next hymn is called, Who Am I? It's not in our hymn book, so the words will pop up on your screen, and it will be in that um, printed newsletter for those of you who receive that. So in the passage that Mylene read, there are so many different images that we could pick up on. There's a bush that burns and doesn't burn up. There's the voice of God speaking out of the flame. And I love the way God speaks their name in this passage. I am who I am, the God of the ancestors. 
But I want us to really focus today on holy ground, the image of holy ground. And so in this passage, we hear God say to Moses, Moses, don't come any closer. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. And the only other place in scripture where we hear the phrase holy ground is in the books of, book of Acts, where the writer is retelling this story. It's a little used phrase in scripture, but the words hold power and meaning. Holy ground is the place where God meets us. It is the place where we feel God's presence. There might be places where we think we should feel God's presence. Several years ago, I had the opportunity to visit Israel and Palestine. And that region is covered with holy places. You can visit the Mount of Olives, the Garden of Gethsemane, Calvary, Jesus' tomb, and many other places of biblical fame. So I'm going to get Tim to pop a picture up for us so we can all see it. So this is a picture from the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem. This is the supposed birthplace of Jesus. And as I walked through this tourist attraction and others, which are a pilgrimage for many, I had the sense that I was supposed to feel something. I wasn't sure what. But I didn't feel a sense of awe. I didn't feel a sense of the holy any more than in any other church or place of worship. I didn't particularly connect to God in these places. And yet I felt like I was supposed to. It didn't feel, I didn't feel anything particular as I wandered these holy sites. The places that are the holy ground of our faith. And then you can switch the picture, Tim. Yeah. Now, this is the site of a Palestinian home bulldozed by the Israeli army. This is one of the places where I felt God. This was a place of holy ground. In this place, I felt anger and frustration and fear and angst and horror. I felt God as I heard the resilience of people who lived through this destruction, who wait for destruction every day. I felt God as I listened to stories of hope. So you can take the picture off. Perfect. So what makes holy ground? For many of us, our sense of holy ground is tied to this church building, or another church, and specifically the worship space. But what makes it holy? Is it the fact that it's consecrated and dedicated to the worship of God? Is it the beautiful stained glass or the beautiful banners that we see on the walls in this space? Is it the pulp pipe organ, which we hear Shani play so often? Is it the pulpit that I stand behind that makes it holy? Well, Moses was out in the wilderness, and there were none of those things. No stained glass, no pipe organ, no pulpit. And something caught him by surprise. A burning bush that wasn't turning to ash. And Moses allowed himself to be curious to go and see what that was. He allowed himself to be open to God. It wasn't the spot that was holy. It wasn't something that had been built on that spot that made it holy. It was the experience that was holy. It was the time in relationship with God that was holy. For many of us, the church buildings are the places we have traditionally come to sing, to worship, to gather in community, to baptize, to share communion. We still do those things, but in different places and in different ways. Does that mean that we have lost our holy ground? This is a time when we might need to rethink what it means to find holy ground. Can we find holy ground in our homes? 
Can we find holy ground as we share a quiet meal by ourselves? Can we find holy ground in nature when we walk? Maybe holy ground is not a place, but a time. The time that we have together on Sunday mornings is holy ground, even though we are not in the same place. Holy ground is within us as we pray, when we sit in the silence, when we listen to or make music, and in so many other ways. Holy ground occurs when we intentionally carve out time to experience God. Holy ground is within us. And holy ground doesn't wait for calm and peace. Moses was in a time of turmoil. He was running away. His people were in distress. Holy ground can come to us in the midst of chaos and uncertainty, as, I, as it did when I visited the destroyed homes in Palestine. In our time, there are so many things that might be unsettling for us. COVID and the disruption to routines and relationships, Black Lives Matter, reconciliation work with Indigenous peoples here in Canada, climate change, hurricanes, so many other things that can unsettle us. But can we find holy ground in the midst of all that uncertainty and chaos? Holy ground doesn't mean that everything is perfect. It means that God comes to us in whatever the circumstances. And there's another layer of holy ground Holy ground is within us. But holy ground is not necessarily the space that we create as humans. Scripture reminds us over and over again that the earth is God's. And the earth, simply by its being, is sacred. Anytime we touch earth, we touch holy ground. In the passage that Mylene read, we hear God telling Moses to remove his shoes. And there are several different theories about why Moses removed his shoes. One is that removing shoes might be a sign of respect. In practices such as meditation and yoga, shoes and socks are often removed so that we can be more connected to the earth. Often when we enter a home, we remove our shoes to keep the dirt out. Now in the middle of a desert, keeping dirt out doesn't necessarily seem to be an issue. So I wonder if Moses is invited to remove his shoes so that he can actually feel God under his feet, feel God more deeply in the sacredness of the earth he walks upon. After the connection between God and Moses is well established, God sends Moses on a mission. He's sent to free the slaves in Egypt. Moses is hesitant about what God is asking him to do. Perhaps Moses is worried that the experience of God's presence in this holy ground moment is temporary. But the physical action of connecting to God's presence through the earth should remind Moses that he gets to take his holy ground with him in every moment. In our own lives, we need to seek out that holy ground. It isn't just about finding holy ground and staying there permanently, finding one spot where we experience God and staying there. God invites us to find those places of holy ground, those moments when we experience God. And then God gives us purpose to serve God's people and God's world. The specifics of what that service looks like are different for each of us. And how we live out this purpose changes over a lifetime. 
There are times when we are able to be more active and times when our service might be to pray. And we get to take the holy ground of God's presence with us wherever we are. Simply by our living, we connect to holy ground and God's presence. I invite you to, to this week, if you have an opportunity, to take a few moments and take your shoes off. If you happen to be able to go out, take your shoes and socks off and put your feet on the ground to remind you of God beneath you, around you, and God within. Amen. next hymn is going to be Soil of God, You and I. If you have your more voices, it's 174 if you want to look it up. And otherwise, you'll see the words on the screen. ministry and mission of St. Andrews and of our dispersed community continues throughout this time, even when we are unable to gather. And so I invite you this morning to take a few moments and consider the offerings that you make every day to the people around you, to the people that you interact with regularly, and to the world beyond that. What do you offer and think in the broadest terms, in terms of your time, your energy, your passions, your talents, your finances. How do your gifts serve God's world and God's people? Recognizing that this is a difficult time financially for many people, if you feel moved and are able, you're invited to financially support the Ministry of St. Andrews by going to our website. Or you can sign up for PAR, which is pre-authorized remittance, which means your money goes directly from your account to our account. 
or you can put checks uh, in the mail or in the mail slot at the front of the church. And if you're part of another congregation, I invite you to continue to support that congregation as well. And I'm going to invite Tim to come and sing, You Raise Me Up.
And so we move into our prayer time this morning. And so I invite you as we gather our prayers today uh, that if you want to offer something into the chat box, you can do that and I'll lift those up. And uh, if you're on the phone and don't have access to the chat box, you can use star six and it will unmute you. And so you'll be able to speak. So let us pray together today. Holy One, as we gather in this place, we give thanks for your gathered people. We give thanks for the gifts and ministries that you place within each of us. And this morning, we give thanks particularly for Tim and his singing for, for us this morning, for that music which lifts our hearts and our souls. We give thanks for Carrie sharing her gifts on the piano. We give thanks for Debbie doing the technical stuff at home. We give thanks for all those ways in which you are our people. We are your people in which you minister through us so we can serve one another, so we can love one another, and so we can lift each other's spirits and hearts with your presence. Oh, Holy One, we pray especially today for those who are impacted by hurricane. We know that in the midst of the chaos of a hurricane, you are still present. In the midst of destruction and the waiting and the wondering and the uncertainty, we know that you are present we know and trust that you will be present with those who are waiting for this hurricane. We pray especially today for all of those who will be returning to school in the next week. For teachers who've already returned to learn new things and set up their classrooms, we pray for them in this time, that they may be strengthened and encouraged, that they may return open to new possibilities and to your spirit working within them. We pray for students who will be returning. We pray that you will surround them with your love and your encouragement, their openness to, to growing and learning, the possibilities that you place within them. And in the midst of those returnings and the new ways of doing school, we pray that you will be with the folks who are feeling anxious and perhaps nervous about this new environment and this new way of doing school. And we pray that you will offer a sense of calm and peace that your presence will strengthen and encourage everyone who's going into those settings. We give thanks, O oh God, today for rain, which refreshes and nourishes the earth. We give thanks for the ways in which we see your presence in the earth. And we pray for all of those this morning who've lost crops and gardens that they were relying on for this winter. Knowing that you are always present. And we pray that you will offer calm, peace, and renewal. Even in the aftermath of that destruction. We pray for farmers and workers beginning their harvest. 
that harvest is successful and safe. We pray for all of those who will be working to take the crops off the land so that others of us may be fed. We pray for their gifts and their ministry, and we give thanks for that gift that they offer the world as they grow crops, as they steward the land, as they feed your people. We give thanks for dentists and pray for dentists who continue to serve us during this time of COVID. And for other healthcare workers and other essential workers who continue to work in situations that are sometimes higher risk, we know that you are present. And we give thanks for their willingness to take those risks and those, their willingness to do what they are called to do to serve others, to support others in this time. And so we gather prayers for your people and for your world, O oh God. And we gather all of these prayers and many others, and we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us, our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So just a couple of announcements. Uh, next week, it's the first week of September, and so we will be sharing communion together. So I invite you next week to have um, a snack of some kind, a snack of whatever you're choosing, something that you enjoy that brings you comfort, and a beverage as well. So it could be your morning coffee, your juice, your cup of tea for the morning, water, whatever it is that uh, you like to have to drink in the morning. So I invite you to have that prepared when you come to worship next Sunday. And I want to say thanks this morning to Tim and Carrie for sharing music with us. Carrie on the piano and Tim doing all of his technical stuff. Uh, every time I come into the sanctuary, it looks a little different because Tim has added something new or rearranged something. And so he's working hard to get all the technical stuff happening behind the scenes and planning for the long term. So eventually, we're not sure when, but eventually when we can have people in this space, We'll also be able to have people online, and so it will all come together seamlessly with his help. So we are thankful for that. And we've got Debbie at home today managing the Zoom room and helping us with all the mics and getting people in this morning. So thanks for that. And in a few moments, we're going to have a virtual coffee at the end of worship. And so after the service is over, if you just sit tight for a minute or so, uh, Debbie's going to divide us into little chat rooms and you'll have five minutes to say good morning and talk to somebody that maybe you haven't seen for quite a while. And uh, it's completely random, so you don't know who you're going to end up having a little five-minute coffee with. So, As we leave our worship today, uh, we're going to be singing, this is called Take Off Your Shoes. It's not, again, it's not in any of our hymn books. Take Off Your Shoes, and it reminds us that the earth that we stand on is holy. It is a gift from God that is blessed and sacred, and it offers us an invitation to care for that earth, for the holy ground upon which we stand. So take off your shoes. shoes you're standing on my holy ground take 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 off your shoes 
you're standing on my holy ground. While the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, from the waters beneath to the heavens above. So take, take, take off your shoes. You're standing on my holy ground. You're standing on my holy ground. Oh. On the eighth day of creation, well, the Lord looked around at the power plants and freeways and the trash on the ground. Plantations growing rubber where the grain should be high. You couldn't see the sun for all the smog in the sky. Well, can't you feel the fruit of the earth and then you subdued it? There's nothing in my book that says you've got to pollute it. So take, take, take off your shoes. You're standing on my holy ground. Take, take, take off your shoes. You're standing on my holy ground. Well, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. From the waters beneath to the heavens above. So take, take, take off your shoes. You're standing on my holy ground. You're standing on my holy ground. You've heated up my rivers with your plants and your mills. You're killing off my ozones with your waste and your spills. You're fishing like there'll always be an endless supply. And fighting one another for what's left to divide. You didn't want advice when I first gave you dominion. But maybe now it's time to get a second opinion. So take, take, take off your shoes. Ground. Take, take, take off your shoes. You're standing on my holy ground. Well, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. From the waters beneath to the heavens above. So take, take, take off your shoes. You're standing on my holy ground. You're standing I dig your scientific minds, but use them with care. You're breaking down my ozone layer up in the air. You're hyped up by its southern, southern soil into stone. And some are eating meat while some don't even get bones. I told you to be fruitful and you sure multiplied. But the rich took all the land and never learned to divide. So take, take off your shoes. Take, take, take off your shoes. You're standing on my holy ground. Well, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. From the waters beneath to the heavens above. So take, take, take off your shoes. You're standing on my holy ground. And so as we leave this time, may each of us find our holy ground, those moments and places where God comes to us, where we experience God's presence, even in the midst of chaos and uncertainty. May you stand on holy ground. Amen. Mm -hmm.